And now let's get to the main portion of our show. We would originally scheduled Justin Harris, whose recent Pluralsight course, Fundamentals of Microsoft Messaging, is designed to help newcomers to the IT ops field understand what Microsoft Messaging looks like and how it works. Sadly, Justin had a last minute scheduling conflict, but I still wanted to talk about Exchange Server and Microsoft Messaging. So I have invited Pluralsight author Jason Helmick, who has taught more than a few Exchange classes in his life, to join us. Jason, welcome to the show. Hey Don, great to be with you. So I guess the big question on everyone's mind these days, at least on mine, is how much longer can I be an Exchange Administrator before there is no such thing? On one hand, we've got well, Exchange 2016. Well, I mean, we've got Exchange 2016 coming out, so I know you've got a minute, but it also seems like this might be the last on-prem release for Exchange. What do you think the future holds for a messaging administrator? You know, that's it's actually a great question, and I'm sure anybody who's who's an Exchange administrator or thinking about going down that route has already started hearing probably for the last couple of years that that job isn't going to exist. And with uh, the upcoming release of Exchange 2016, it, it really you can take a look at it and Microsoft is really speaking volumes with that release. There's no wow features coming with 2016. In fact, when you, if you take a look at the preview right now, and we're just right around the corner from the release of this, it looks just like Exchange 2013, which oddly enough, looks just like Exchange Online in Office 365. Now, where are the investments in Exchange 2016 and, for that matter, updates to 2013 coming from? Well, this is all being done in the cloud first, where they get their greatest experience. When you start looking at things like high availability and database availability groups, Microsoft has more experience and their engineers have more experience than anybody else on the face of the planet doing just that. And so they're taking all that experience that they get from the cloud, and they're making some updates to the on-premises version. Well, what does this mean for an Exchange engineer? Well, it means that it really helps to understand what's going on in the cloud because that's where it's going to happen first. The other thing is, is start to realize that for a lot of businesses, and this is a discussion all into itself, for a lot of businesses, it no longer makes sense both from a cost standpoint and from just a regular production and maintenance standpoint to maintain an on-premise exchange or messaging system anymore. And I, I like to say to a lot of people, you know, how many Gmail servers do you have in your network? And the answer is, is that you don't have any. So what's the future look like? Well, it sounds like it looks pretty bleak. However, I do want to point out that a lot of companies that are going to use Exchange Online and going to the cloud, they go into what's called a hybrid uh, type of migration where um, they still have some on-premise resources, and then they have their Exchange Online or their cloud-based resources. And a lot of companies are making this decision where they're putting accounts up into the cloud, but some accounts they're still not quite comfortable with moving up there. And it may be a political reason. It may not be a technical one, but it's still a reason they don't want to move all their accounts up to the cloud. And for that reason, they live in this hybrid mode. Well, you're still going to need Exchange engineers for that. And this hybrid mode, I've talked to several Microsoft Premier Field engineers over the last couple of years. Uh, we expect actually this hybrid mode to probably last quite a long time. So I would say that if you're already into messaging or you want to get into messaging, it's still a good route to get into. But be aware you definitely want to be able to look at this from the implementation of a, of a hybrid uh, setup. You want to be able to understand federated identities and how this works with the cloud. And I do want to point out that um, I don't get much work anymore as an exchange engineer, so I have alternative career options in place. Well, let me, let me explore that a bit, because obviously at Pluralsight, we're really about helping people's careers. And, and you know that I've always made a distinction between your career and your current job. Your career is what you do for your life, and your job is what you do right now. Is it safe for someone who – I mean, there, there's certainly people out there, lots of them, that their full-time job is managing exchange. And they're, they're probably raising their hands right now going, yeah, my company is never going to not need me. Is that safe? Is it safe to only be able to do messaging? Well, again, I think you bring up a great point. And I would concur that in my career is IT. And that means that uh, the job I'm doing today, I'm not married to that job. I never have been. Um, I, I work with messaging all the way back to Lotus Notes, but that's 
one of several products. And most of the product lines I work with, while today they're Microsoft oriented, they certainly haven't always been. My job as an IT person is to be able to address the business needs uh, that the business has at that time to reach its mission. And so I have a lot of skills. And I think what's most important is to always keep learning additional skills. And in this case with Exchange, it, it also weatherproofs you um, in the sense that let's say that at your particular company, the mood suddenly does change with uh, the C exec level, and they do want to start going down the cloud-based route. Well, saying that the company is never going to do it, well, suddenly you just had the rug pulled out. If you already have capabilities and, and other way, things that you can do, you're already ahead of the game. You know, one of the best things that I think uh, both you and I probably agree with on is that the best part about learning Exchange is learning how to automate Exchange. Well, once you have that PowerShell skill, now you can go across to several different product lines and automate several different product lines. And it really is the best thing for you to do is to learn, 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 learn as much as you possibly can about all the products that your business needs to be successful. So staying on messaging but switching products slightly, I want to talk about Microsoft's real-time communications platform. Uh, it's been through a lot of names. Exchange UC, Office Communicator, Link, and now Skype for Business. What do you see <laughs> in the future for this thing? Should it be an education priority for IT ops professionals, or will, will this kind of be a specialty subject? <laughs> and here's where I'm probably going to get into a little bit of trouble. When, when I personally am looking at things that uh, I need to make sure that my skill sets are up on, I have to admit, uh, as far as Link Online and Link, has been concerned. I've been a little bit slow on it. And the reason really is, is implementations. Companies that are implementing it, a lot of them already have other products that they've been using. And so while Link started to gain some strength, that didn't gain as much as what a lot of people expected. Link Online still misses a couple of primary pieces to it. Now they've, they've rebranded it, right, with Skype and, and Skype for Business. And when you do start to look at Office 365, all of a sudden, from my perspective, Skype for Business now makes a lot more sense why you want to start to use it. There are not only a lot of you know, lists and lists of features, but just being able to be in one application, not to have to switch to another application, know where somebody is and be able to communicate them in whatever current form they wish to be communicated with, Skype for Business helps a lot with that information. And you know, as I work more and more with Office 365, some of the primary aspects are Exchange Online and you use SharePoint. And you combine those together. You do e-discovery across them. Well, now we can do e-discovery. We've been able to do this in O365 for some time where we can do e-discovery across all the products, which includes all those conversations going on in Skype uh, for Business. So I think that as, as people start to take a look at the benefits in their way that their people work, they're going to see that Skype for Business makes much more sense even if they have some of those other third-party products in place for like phones. So we're going to be talking next to a Pluralsight author who's recently been uh, working through a lot of security courses. But from a messaging perspective, what do you think is one of the bigger overlooked security aspects of an organization's messaging systems? Like, like briefly, anything people should be rushing to double check right now? <laughs> yeah, and this is one of my little pet peeves, and it's something that um, usually I have people say, you know, my business will never run anything through the cloud. And my first response is, is um, do, do any of your users ever use Gmail? If so, your corporate information, confidential information, has already been going through the cloud for decades. If you were to work with Exchange, and this is both on-premise and Exchange Online, starting with Exchange 2013 especially, and of course with Exchange 2016, you have much better control over who can send what documents, when they're allowed to open up those documents. If they're off-site, they may not even see that there's an attachment that they can open. You have much more security control over your corporate confidential information. And with Exchange Online and Exchange On-Premises, you now have many more compliance options than you've ever had before. So if your company has to meet a certain federal regulation, Exchange can help ensure that that occurs. And so think about it data that only people you want authorized to be able to see it, and being able to maintain compliancy, you can't do that with Gmail. And so when it comes to security, that right there 
is a big change to where your corporate confidential uh, data is ending up. Well, good. Good information. And thanks for joining us. So I, I know you've been working on some SSCP training for Pluralsight, which will be coming out probably early next year, late this year. So feel free to hang around on the call as we introduce our next author. Uh, up next is Pluralsight author Chris Rees. And Chris just wrapped an entire series of courses covering CompTIA's new Security Plus exam. Chris, welcome aboard. Hey, Don. Appreciate, appreciate you having me here. Thanks very much. Absolutely. So, you know, I know a lot of folks who are joining us are probably fairly experienced, and maybe they're thinking, ah, CompTIA, ah, Security Plus. But it, it seems to me like not a day goes by without a major security breach popping up on CNN. And it, it seems like many of these breaches, though, go right down to a failure in implementing some of the very basic stuff like you covered in your courses. What do you think that like institutionally we're doing wrong? Is, is it a lack of understanding in the industry, or is management just not paying attention to the basics? Well, I think it's, it's a combination of a few things. I mean, definitely I think there is a, a, an air of complacency, especially on larger corporations. I mean, it's impossible for, <clears throat> for pardon me, executive management to, to really police every aspect of it. And obviously the, the, the security teams that are tasked with those specific functions, they're, they're up to speed and they know what's going on. And, and certainly they're doing their job. But security really is a, is a, it's a top-down approach. It's an all-in mindset. So from everybody from the executive to the security teams we mentioned, but even down to the end users, it's the weakest link that actually breaks the chain. So if users uh, don't follow the basic, I mean, just common sense security practices, then that leaves the door wide open. You know, as I mentioned uh, in some of the courses, it doesn't matter how many locks you have on the front door if the side window is wide open. Right? So if the, if the user lets somebody in, takes a phone call, ask, answers a question, even though they, they're not really sure if they should be asking it, let somebody into the front door if they don't have a badge, you know, things along these lines, it makes it very easy for someone to, to penetrate uh, defenses no matter how strong you know, they may be. And, and how can you start to harden that link? I mean, it, it seems like a lot of what we do here is, is that, that, that personal. You know, people come in through the social engineering. H how do you help your users just kind of understand that this is always a potential thing and, and understand what the latest threat profile looks like? Well, that, that's, that's a continuing challenge. It really just depends on, on how bought in uh, the company itself is to that that endeavor. Uh, a lot of companies will go through an, an issue maybe once a year or maybe twice a, twice a year, uh, 30 minute or 10 minute you know, video on Harry the Hacker and, and here's what you should do and, and now you know, it's a checkbox and they're compliant. But that really doesn't drill home the, the, the overall importance. So there needs to be a, an additional layer of training, I think, at least in my mind, above just a very short you know, once a year type of training, whether that means you know, pen testers come in and actually do some penetration testing and then come back and display the results maybe at an all-hands meeting and let the company know, you know, hey, we did this, this, and this, and look at how far we got and look what we could have done if we were malicious and kind of open people's eyes. Or perhaps uh, you know, uh, from time to time open up some type of a honey pot or a honey net to let people in and, and then actually kind of pull back the kimono, so to speak, and, and, and show those results of, of what actually uh, transpired throughout that exercise. So it gives people an idea that, hey, here I thought my, my company was some kind of one-off that nobody really cared about, but guess what? Uh, hackers are actually targeting my company. It doesn't matter if they're mom and pop or Fortune you know, 500 or Fortune 50. Everybody gets hacked or at least attempted to be hacked at some point. Some are obviously much bigger targets than others. Now, you mentioned pen testing. Uh, ethical hacking, a very popular draw these days. I think it's driven in part mm -hmm. by high-profile events like DEF CON and Black Hat. YouTube is filled with videos on pen testing and Kali Linux. Do you think this is a fad? Do you think it's a trend? Do you think it's something that every IT ops person should, should be considering? Well, I, I definitely think every security uh, personnel or, or somebody in a security field should, should be looking at. That's definitely a skill set that can help. Uh, but again, it comes down to a, a corporate mindset. If the corporation or the company itself is not really amenable to that and somebody starts doing some, <laughs> starts doing some pen testing and all of a sudden you know, they get in trouble for you know, quote unquote hacking their own network, it's definitely got to be a coordinated approach, a coordinated effort. It's not something that somebody can learn those skills and kind of go off and say, well, I'm going to show them or I'm going to, I'm going to kind of uh, you know, teach them a lesson and show them where their defenses are down because that could land you in some hot water as well. So it's, it's definitely a coordinate, coordinated effort. I had a conversation recently with somebody, um, and, and Jason, I think you were even in on this conversation, and it kind of came down to, to something like this. We all kind of assume that someone's going to try to hack us, and so we try and build up our defenses a lot. 
And the, the person on the other side of the conversation started drawing a, a kind of an analogy to disaster recovery. We all certainly hope that the power to the data center doesn't go out, but we know it might eventually because it's out of our control. And so we build up our defenses. We have backup batteries. We have generators, whatever else. But what's funny is while, while the security and the, the recovery, the disaster recovery kind of follow a, a parallel line. You know, we know something could happen. We hope it doesn't, but it's out of our control, so we build up defenses. Disaster recovery seems to go a step further and assume that it will happen, and you have a plan for what to do. You, know, you have this, this off-site recovery. You've got a, a, a free ring binder with the phone numbers for the electrical company and your company's electrical contractor. You kind of have all these things that you know you're going to do because eventually it's going to happen and it's going to overcome your defenses. Why don't we do the same thing with security? Should we have a plan in place for the inevitable, or is it just not inevitable? Well, I, uh, that's a really good point. I, I think a lot of companies – well, let me back up one. To your point, some companies do that, and that's, that's great. They do their tabletop exercises, and they run through their, their kind of what-ifs and, and their different types of scenarios, and they, they have – uh, you know protocols to address those things, and sometimes they do it maybe you know bi yearly once a year. Uh, they, some companies do do similar things with security. However, uh, a lot don't just because of the time and effort required, or they think that what they have in place is enough. You know we have our IDP or intrusion detection and prevention systems. We've got you know FireEye or Mandiant or Lastline or whoever the, the big security companies are in place. We spent millions of dollars for these types of defenses, but not realizing that if the wrong person takes a phone call and gives out information that they shouldn't have, you know, that person can use that information from a social engineering perspective, make another phone call, use the information they just learned to get you know, more information, and kind of drill down. And a lot of those technical controls are great. Obviously, they can, they can get uh, probably 90% of the people trying to hack in through that specific attack vector, but it doesn't really address the social engineering and just the personnel issue, the insider threat. So it's really a multi-pronged approach that a lot of companies just don't understand that, that layered defense in depth. They think we have all of our applications and our, and our software in place. That's really all we need. And it comes down to really an educational uh, perspective, really. Well, speaking Don, of education, could, oh, yeah, yeah, jump in, Jason. Yeah, if I could just jump in. I, I totally agree with what Chris is saying. And I want to kind of highlight one of the points that he was uh, bringing up is that, you know, it, the security is a top-down approach. And from the question that you just asked, you know, we, we have these – IT admins have this certain process for disaster recovery. How come it doesn't feel that we have these on the IT security side? You know, and we actually do, and, but it's part of that top-down approach. So take um, a typical uh, risk management framework that, that a company might implement. First of all, that's not visible enough for most of the stakeholders and the business leaders. They don't grasp the need. Now, they're seeing all kinds of stuff on CNN now, which hopefully they're starting to grasp it more, but they need a clear plan of action. So a, a risk management uh, framework that allows um, the IT and IT security to be able to, well, do the basic things they're supposed to be doing, identifying what potential vulnerabilities and risks are out there to the assets of the company, and there's formalized procedures for this. Then identifying your mitigation procedures, just like we would do with disaster recovery, and then we need to also have, with those mitigation procedures, a way of monitoring to make sure that those controls are effective and that they're doing what they're supposed to do. But we always still want to have an incident um, uh, type of reporting system where we can make sure that if something does go wrong, just like with disaster recovery, that we have the recovery capabilities already in place. So it should be just as well managed as any other aspect. I think one of the challenges is, is sometimes Security people that I work with and some of the, 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 the IT admins that I work with, they don't like to talk to each other. And part of that, that, that needs to be broken down. Those silos need to be kind of destroyed. And the knowledge that both people bring together, that's more powerful to the company. IT admins need to know more about security. They need to understand what's going on out there. And security guys, there's just a lot of stuff to learn about risk management that IT admins have been doing for a long time. So I think getting the company from a top-down approach and getting everybody to talk to each other and start to work together in a unified risk management platform is really beneficial. So before we move on, uh, Jason, you know, as I mentioned, you're right in the middle of the SSCP, which is kind of entry-level practices. 
Uh, Chris, you, you just finished up a long series on the Security Plus, and now you're working on CompTIA's Advanced Security Practitioner Training. So you both kind of have your heads around some of the things that a lot of us would consider to be the, the basics or the fundamentals. And, and if you had to pick, and I'll pose this question to each of you, if you had to pick just one or two key fundamental security things that anyone in IT ops should go revisit today, things that they probably learned a long time ago, but it's a good time to refresh, what would your suggestions be? Uh, and, and Chris, I'll kick it to you first. Sure. Yeah, I mean, that's really, that could go so many different directions. I mean, the, the basics, just to get down to a basic level, and I think just from an ease of exploitation perspective, it would, it would be an eye on physical security, because social engineering is kind of the low-hanging fruit and you don't necessarily have to be a very skilled hacker, technically speaking, to, to kind of uh, go through that process. So I think from a, from a people's perspective, people that aren't necessarily IT savvy or, or uh, IT and security administrators, just understanding the phone calls, don't, get, don't give out information, even if it sounds like it's coming or being asked from someone that's you know, higher up within the company, making sure that everything is kind of vetted first, make sure the number is, is understood. Hey, I'll give you a call back, give me a number I can reach you, that type of thing. Um, not letting people walk through, uh, kind of tailgate through some of the physical securities because, again, even if you have a, an air-gapped system, and this was evident even with, um, with, with Stuxnet and the Natanz nuclear facility out in Iran, that was an air-gapped facility, but they walked through and they were able to drop uh, USBs, USB keys, and other things that were picked up and inadvertently plugged into systems, and then from there it just kind of went out and, and spidered through the network and was able to, to map everything and send the information back. So it's, a lot of times it's the simple... Uh, things, the simple breaches that, that really net the most return. So a lot of times it's not really the, the millions of dollars that you're spending on the perimeters that somebody can walk right through the front door and, and affect some type of breach. Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, in fact, we've had a number of really high profile breaches, the Sony uh, Picture Studios breach, uh, and a lot that were built from a, a physical intrusion first, not an electronic one. Uh, I always used to tell right. folks when I, I worked uh, in a you know, big office, uh, they'd come down and say, well, we need you to make sure that all the file permissions are right on the file server. I said, look at all these printouts laying around. I'm not securing anything until people lock those things up or shut them. So I totally get it. Uh, Jason, what would you right. say? And, and I would agree with both you and Chris on this. Um, and I would just, uh, as I have this conversation with a lot of IT admins and trying to remind them of the importance of security, I have a tendency to throw out the phrase that the worst security is the security not implemented. And what that really means is, is for IT admins, you already know a lot about what you need to be doing to secure your environment. Great example is, and I use this as kind of a stump question, so let me kind of try it on you, Don. Um, in your network, if you are aware of any shares on a Windows server where users have, well, more permissions than they're supposed to have, well, you're now kind of part of the security problem. In other words, if you're aware of this and haven't fixed it, then that's where the security challenges start to come in. It's this lackadaisical approach. So really what, what I would hope to encourage people to do is, yes, I think IT admins should learn more about security. I think it really matters, and we're seeing it constantly, how businesses are being affected. I can't tell you how many times my credit card has had to be changed out recently. Um, but at the same time, we already know a lot of basics that we're not actually fulfilling that we need to go back to and make sure that we're doing. We've got to make sure that we've applied the permissions correctly. And I know it's a tough job, and that's one of the reasons you want to get into automation to make your life easier on this. But go back to the basics that we already know and make sure that we've done the groundwork that we need to do to help secure the system. And then definitely, you know, like Chris mentioned, social engineering and it is, is definitely you know, part of that low-hanging fruit but go back to those basics and take care of the stuff that you already know how to take care of and make sure it's locked up. Oh, excellent information. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for joining us, and I will be looking forward to your next Plural Site courses.